Chapter 12, Going to Church During the first few weeks of conversion under Christ, in February 1970, there were a series of meetings held at the Limes Avenue Baptist Church. The person speaking was at Lance Pibworth, and a girl called Geraldine Dunbar was being baptised. I saw my first baptism here, after the meeting, and a man informed the congregation that if any wanted to talk about these things and ask questions, they could stay behind and ask afterwards. On this occasion, I had brought Pat Jones and Paddy along to the meeting. I was dressed in my overalls and leather jacket, which I always wore when working on cars. I wasn't dressed up at all. I knew God did not look on the outward appearance, but man may do, so it didn't bother me that we were not dressed for the occasion. I asked to see the minister, Mr. Sidthorpe, and we three were invited into his study. I explained to Mr. Sidthorpe about my conversion, and I wanted him to confirm what I was saying to Pat Jones and Paddy, that it was in fact true. On that occasion, I half expected him to baptise me there and then. I was under the impression from reading the scriptures any minister or Christian were under direct command to baptise new believers as soon as they believed. I was very disappointed that he did not command me to be baptised that night. I knew nothing about church membership, modes of baptism, doctrinal distinctions and the like, only that I should be baptised. Shortly after this, I met a man called Charlie Tweedy of the Church of Christ meeting at Stoke Mandeville Road, Aylesbury. It's now a Seventh-day Adventist church. He maintained that unless you are baptised, you cannot be saved. He held some kind of responsible position in the church, so I explained to him about my conversion, after which he gave me his telephone number to ring him if I needed help. I knew he was wrong about baptism, so felt constrained to speak to him, as I reasoned according to him, I shall be damned if I die today if I am not baptised. I felt the need to reassure him that that was not the case, and he need not worry. When I rang him, he seemed nonplussed, nor moved with concern, that I was not yet baptised. Again, I was disappointed. I had not been accustomed to go to any particular church, but did go to a Sunday night meeting with Mrs. Knight. This was the Assemblies of God Four Square Pentecostal Church, meeting at Rickford's Hill. The pastor baker was the minister. Here I was received without any question and made to feel welcome. This was also the church that Cyril Bryan went to and where I met Barry Crown. Here's the church building where Charlie Tweedy attended on Mandeville Road in Aylesbury. This is where I was informed that baptism by immersion was essential to salvation. And here is a picture of Rickford's Hill, the Assemblies of God Church. On one occasion, I was asked to give an up-to-date testimony as to the laws dealing with me that week. So, dressed as I was, in my working clothes, that is overalls, not knowing a difference between working days and Sabbath days, I went to the front of the congregation and gave a clear and detailed account of how I had combated the devil's suggestion to steal a car battery that week. I had some trouble with my car battery and I needed a new one. The temptation was this. Here was I, passing Adam's garage on the Tring Road. I needed a car battery. Just over the fence belonging to the garage were several car batteries. All I needed to do was nip over the fence, help myself. This was a way I had thought in the past, and would have done just that at one time. Not now. This kind of thinking was the old man of whom I had to continually combat. I knew Satan had a hand in this temptation. To avoid this temptation, I rebuked the devil and told him to clear off in Jesus' name. On that occasion, I told them the exact language that I used to the devil. I said to the devil, Bugger off Satan! I was quite unaware of the bad language I had used. And, a number of years later, Barry Crown reminded me that Cyril Bryan gently reproved me for my speech that day. I didn't know that I had said anything amiss so was unaware that I had even been reproved for using bad language. I don't think I knew what the word meant anyway. 
I knew from the scripture and believed I should be baptised, and expected Pastor Baker of the Assemblies of God Church to command me to be baptised. I knew this was the command of Jesus, and it signified the new birth, which I had already experienced. It also symbolised my union with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection, that through his death I was to reckon myself dead to sin, indeed, and my former sinful ways, and that by his resurrection was to reckon myself risen with him to the newness of life, which is in him. No one spoke to me about being baptised. At that time, shortly after the Lions Avenue meetings, I was taken to another group of Christian meetings at Fleet Street in a large shed. These were West Indians, and the pastor was Mr. Bruce from Luton. The group also was having a series of meetings leading up to baptism. I heard they had permission to use the baptistry at Lions Avenue Baptist Church, so I asked Pastor Bruce to baptise me. He said he would and asked me to attend baptismal classes that week with other people being baptised. Pastor Bruce from Luton was the overseer. I didn't know what this was all about, but presumed it was to make the person being baptised know what it was all about. I was not told that after the baptism I was expected to join the church meeting at Fleet Street. I was baptised, I was dipped by immersion, upon the confession of my faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ early one Sunday morning at 7am at Lyme's Avenue Baptist Church. My friends turned up, Pat Jones, Paddy, Paul Brooks, Mrs Knight and Mrs Chapsky. Pastor Bruce baptised me in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost according to the command of our Lord Jesus in Matthew 28 verse 19. I say this because I had met some that were teaching baptism was only valid if it was administered in the name of Jesus only. The reason being that they said the name of the Father is Jesus, and the name of the Son is Jesus, and the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus. Gordon Smith of Albert Street informed me that some considered it was necessary to be rebaptized in the name of Jesus only, and that all other baptisms were invalid. I was not impressed by their reasonings, and stress upon the singular name of Jesus, to the exclusion of the Father and the Spirit, for Jesus had commanded baptism to be performed in the name of all three persons. It was about this time that two Mormons spoke to me, whilst I was on the drive at our home in Finmere Crescent, and they were insisting that my baptism was invalid, as it was not conducted by a person having the right authority. As I'd read the scripture and understood what baptism was all about, I realised that these men were wrong. In later years, I came across similar views by some primitive Baptists in the Philippines, but they too were wrong. I had been baptised according to the terms of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that my baptism was as valid as if John the Baptist himself had baptised me. I knew that as far as I could discern from scripture, a man could be dipped, dragged, ducked, drenched, soaked, sprinkled, or dribbled with ten thousand gallons of water. It would not make a scrap of difference to his spiritual state. Baptism could not affect the new birth, remove sin, or make a natural man a spiritual man, for that was the sole prerogative of him that proceeds from the Father and sent by the Son. John 15 verse 26 the new birth being the effects, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God alone. John 1.13 Therefore baptism could not save a sinner. I soon realised there were few churches in Aylesbury that believed that the baptism in the Holy Spirit was a distinct experience from being born again. I had no problem with this, as that is how I read the Bible. I actually felt I was baptised in the Spirit when I first believed and Jesus spoke to me. The only thing I seemed to lack was speaking in tongues. This had not happened. I remember speaking to Mr. Sidthorpe, the pastor of the Strict Baptist Church, which was Limes Avenue, about these things, and he gave me an article written by John Stott, who denied the baptism of the Spirit as I knew it. 
I was amazed at the way these people twisted and wriggled out of what God had plainly spoken about. At that time, I read as much as I could about this experience, because this experience was not recognised by any other group of Christians apart from the Elim Pentecostal churches. The best book that I read at that time was by Derek Prince, called From Jordan to Pentecost. This gave a very clear and biblical position about speaking in tongues, and it being the evidence of the baptism of the Spirit. Being converted unto Christ was by no means an outward imposed principle. I was not under any set of rules. I was not under any kind of legal fear to serve God, a rule which says, Do this and you'll be okay. There was no rest in works that I could do. It was, in fact, the rule of faith. It was to walk by faith, without which it was impossible to please God. I was what the scripture described, a new man, with an inward desire to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture expressed this as God's writing his laws upon the fleshly tables of the heart. Hebrews 8, 10-13 I began to read the Bible straight away, and I read the Good News Bible within two weeks of receiving it, which was a good thing for me, who could hardly read. I was able to understand most of what I read, and thought I understood it all at first. Before this time, I was ignorant of its contents, and very soon the principal points of the gospel became very clear to me. The divine nature, or deity, of Jesus Christ was essential to understand. Hell was real, just as heaven was sure. The actual reality of Adam and Eve, and the fall of our first parents. The need for the shed blood of Jesus Christ to remove sin. That salvation was the forgiveness of sins by faith alone, without works done by us. We were not under the law of Moses, as the Jews were, but under Christ Jesus, under his rule, by his law, the gospel of love and grace. I remember trying to tell one of my friends about following Jesus, saying that I didn't have to give up anything to become a Christian. I simply found I didn't want to do certain things any more. This lad came up to me some time after this, and I'm sure he misunderstood me, and in front of several other lads said, Is it right, Dave, you don't have to give up anything to become a Christian? He was expecting my answer to be, No, you can carry on just as you are. However, I said, That's right, you don't have to give up anything except sin. This silenced him, and I think they all got the point. I learned that God's way of saving people was through the preaching of Christ, and him crucified, and that the new birth was a must. What amazed me was the apparent lack of zeal and knowledge of them that had professed faith in Christ. Also, how these persons tended to try and entertain people by means of music instead of preaching. On the 22nd of May, 1972, I was asked to give my testimony at a meeting of people in Luton, about 400 people. I was not sure what the meeting was all about, so I simply spoke as I felt right to do. I spoke the gospel as best I could. I was not fully conversant with the doctrines of grace at that time, but I was soon to learn the word more perfectly. Providentially, this meeting was recorded and may be viewed and listened to on YouTube under the title Converted on LSD Trip, 1972, David Clark. Every day was the Lord's day to me. I awoke. I was conscious of the presence of God. And when I slept, yes, even in my dreams, I knew of no distinctions of days, such as holy days or Sabbath days, for I knew that these be abolished in and fulfilled in Jesus Christ, being the sum and substance of the Mosaic Sabbaths and Sabbath. He was the body that cast the shadow of the Mosaic law. Colossians 2, 16-17 The Old Testament Sabbath day prefigured the Gospel day in which the believer rests from impious rebellion and war with his Maker, from legal labour for life, and from the intolerable burden of sin, as well as an eternal rest from the indwelling of sin in heaven. Quotation from William Huntington Authorised Version of the Bible At the Assemblies of God Church at Rickford's Hill, we had a representative from the Trinitarian Barber Society speak. 
Mr. Cyril Bryan confirmed his belief how important it was for us to use a good translation of the Bible. It was pointed out to me that the modern versions often left out or changed the text of Scripture, which clearly taught the deity of Christ. From that time I began to be cautious of new versions and was happy to stick with the authorised version. This was helpful because all the books that I had begun to read from the 17th to the 20th century quoted from the authorised version of Scripture and not modern translations. On another occasion I was attending the Evangelical Meetings at Fleet Street Pentecostal Church and there was an appeal for money to support the young musicians. The man making the appeal was so moving I felt I ought to give all I could. I reached to my pocket and put in the collection plate all the money I had. I was giving it as unto the Lord, and it was needed. I was happy to give. Shortly after this, the same steward who had collected the money came back to me from the front of the meeting hall, speaking and motioning to me with a roll of notes in his hands, saying, Was I aware how much I'd given? I said, Yes, that's OK. It was probably about £200, as I was still used to carrying that sort of money around with me in my pocket, as in 1970. Shortly after this, at another meeting, there was a visiting evangelist, and he too made similar moving appeals for money. I'd also spoken to him about my tattoo on my arm. This was because I regretted having it. He had been saying, if I believed in God and had faith, then it would go away by a miracle. I asked him, would he pray to have it removed? At the same meeting, he went on to appeal for money, with a prophecy saying the Lord had told him that each one had to give from their bank account 10% of all their money and give it to him the next day. It followed by another vision of an accident that was going to take place if it was not done. At the same meeting, he said, there was someone in the meeting that doubted God and that they must get off their seat and come forward that if they didn't, then another warning be issued. I knew because of my previous talks with him, he had me in mind. I then began to think his so-called prophecy and visions were not of God, but generated to control and manoeuvre people like witchcraft. I then opposed this, and would have nothing more to do with it. I even went to Mr. Eric Connett and informed him that this type of talk and action was not genuine. Mr. Connett was a preacher at the church and had some influence and could have helped correct this kind of error. I'll write this for the sake of any who may feel similar pressure from them who say they've had a word from the Lord or the Lord has sent them for not all that is spoken in the name of the Lord is of God. The Lord loves the cheerful giver. The Lord does not need our money. He wants our hearts. All that we have is his, when this is the case. We are stewards of all that we own. I learned, like the Sabbath, there are no Sabbath days. For every day is Sabbath, so with money. There is no tithe of ten percent, but all our possessions are the Lord's, not just ten percent. I found it my natural desire to preach and speak about Jesus to whoever I could. I remember working on a car in Mount Street one Sunday morning, and a crowd of street kids, all whom I knew, were playing around doing nothing. I was dressed in my overalls and a leather jacket, and I suggested that they come with me to the church. I decided to take them to a former Brethren Assembly called Granville Street Evangelical Church. I knew all these lads, and I realised, untidily dressed, and that we may not be readily accepted. I knew, however, the scripture which taught, when you are invited to a meal, then take the lowest seat or place in the room. I decided we should adopt this principle, so we went into the hall, part way through the meeting, and we sat down on the floor. This we did without any noise. These lads were Paul Mitchell, Clifford Attlee, Tatty, Michael Clark, and one or other two others. Granville Street Evangelical Church, Aylesbury, were former brethren. 
And this is where I took these lads from the street to the meeting that Sunday morning. All the eyes of the congregation seemed to be on me and the meeting was stopped. And a man came up and sure enough, according to the scripture, we were invited to sit on the chairs towards the front of the meeting room. Later on in the meeting, they had what was called the breaking of bread. They were an open communion church and their custom was to allow any believer to partake of the bread and wine. As the bread and the cup passed by, they could help themselves. This bread and wine spoke of the death of Jesus till he come again. On this occasion, however, when the plate and the cup came to our road, we were passed by. We were judged as ineligible by an outward appearance, and not as God judges. The problem then, I suppose, was we didn't dress as Christians. It was at this time I met Mr Peter Howe, a former pastor of Herne Bay Evangelical Church, who also befriended my friends Paul and Sue Aston. Paul was a Bible student, studying at Watford Bible College, and I valued any help I could get. It was soon after this that Mr Peter Howe became the pastor of Ivinghoe Particular Baptist Church, and Paul and his wife became members. Mr Howe made it clear to me that he was against what he called hyper-Calvinism, which he stated was the position of the Gospel Standard Baptists. It was not possible to make headway with him, as he seemed insistent that he was right. He was what I now call a Fullerite. He mocked the term dead elect, a term that I understood to refer to the elect who were still dead in their trespasses and sins, and had no problem with this term. Now I had heard Mr Hill from Luton use it from time to time. By this time I had come to a fairly comprehensive knowledge of the gospel truths. I had come to believe in the sovereignty of God the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, his eternal sonship, the value and authority of the authorised version of the Bible, the everlasting purpose of God, of the Trinity of persons in the Godhead, predestination, election, justification by imputed righteousness, and the new birth, and a call to glorify God in declaring these things to others. And having knowledge of these things, more than any others, enable me to discern the many errors of many who profess faith in Christ, I was shocked at the ignorance of so many. I was encouraged by my friends to go to various churches, and on one occasion the church meeting in Long Crendon had a visiting preacher that year, and it was Dr Martin Lloyd-Jones. This man had a real gift to preach, and I could tell he understood doctrine, but he was never outspoken as to his belief in absolute predestination, although you could tell he would know of these things, and many more. I heard him also on another occasion as he preached also at the Ivanhoe Particular Baptist Church where Mr Howe had become the minister and also where Mr and Mr Dick Senior was members along with Paul Aston and his wife.